Good evening, everyone. Good evening. On behalf of the Rabbi Alta Schneier Parkey State School and Parkey Synagogue, I welcome you to an evening with Dr. Rona Novik. We thank the Alon family for sponsoring this event. My name is Barbara Etra. I'm principal of the day school, and it's my pleasure to be your host this evening. We welcome Dr. Sherry Weiner, Director of Student Services, and Debbie Rockland, Director of Early Childhood and Admissions. Dr. Novick is a renowned clinical psychologist, author, and Dean of the Azrieli Graduate School of Jewish Education and Administration of Yeshiva University. She holds the Rain and Stanley Silverstein Chair in Professional Ethics and Values. Dr. Novick is a frequent presenter to professionals and families, and it's our pleasure to have her here with us this evening. Much will be covered in our time together, but if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. We will have a question and answer session after the presentation. And now, Dr. Nova. Thank you, Mrs. Etra. Thank you to the sponsors for this evening. Thank you all for taking time out of your Wednesday evening to be with us. Um, and I'm going to intermittently share my screen. So uh, hopefully this, the technology works. And here we go. And we are going to together muddle and manage through the challenges of life amid COVID-19. It has been a year like no other, whether you're a parent with little children or school-aged children at home, whether you're a parent of adolescent, whether you're a grandparent, whether you are trying to work from your home, welcome to my home office. This is now, my commute is about five steps instead of you know five hours. Um, that's the good news, but there are definitely ways that the current situation has challenged all of us. And what I wanna do tonight is to give you some understanding of what we're all going through and some tools and strategies to uh, help us all. I like to call our situation the new not normal. I refuse to call it the new normal because I refuse to acknowledge that this is our future. I really do believe we will please God soon in our days get to a place um, that looks much more familiar than strange. Uh, but our new not normal includes a new way of thinking about distance and togetherness, a new way of living with danger and the anxiety about it, a new and pervasive sense of uncertainty. Almost every question that you ask the medical professionals about COVID, the answer is, uh, well, we don't really know that yet. Um, and we are dealing with biological and psychological implications of our current situation and of its aftermaths. Our goal, by the way, our goal really is not perfection, but it isn't just muddling or management. Our goal really is something called resilience. Resilience, according to the American Psychological Association, is the process of adapting in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And we certainly are living with adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and significant sources of stress. I always put this picture of palm trees when I talk about resilience, because here in the Northeast where we get lots of storms, you know, whether you're looking in Central Park or whether you're in suburbia, what happens in our big windy storms here in the Northeast? Limbs crack, trees are sometimes uprooted whole from their root ball because they have no flexibility. The trees we have here, the elms and the oaks and the sycamores, they're rigid. They don't give when a storm comes along. A palm tree does, it'll bend almost in half and when the wind stops, it goes right back to the way it was. Resilience is about that flexibility to bounce back. And that's really what our, our muddling and managing is going to be about. Now, one of the pieces of muddling and managing and I put, you know, is this good or is this actually a challenge is that we're not doing this alone. Many of us, many of us are much more connected 
to a much smaller group of people than ever before. We are not leaving our homes to go to work. We are now working in our homes. We are not, some of us, sending our children off to school every day. The children are at home. We are not traveling out and about in our own spheres. We are locked in with the same group of people. And those group of people are a collection of different temperaments. We may have some people who love noise and other people who love quiet in the same house. We have people with a shared history, although I've seen many families where in-laws wound up or spent significant amount of time together because of quarantine or other issues. And those are people we don't have shared history with and may have great deal of tension in those relationships. We have an expectation that we're gonna share celebrations and we're gonna support each other through challenges, but that's not always possible with the group of people that, again, we didn't necessarily choose to spend this time with, but that, oops, sorry, but that we wind up spending time with. And finally, for those of us in families with different developmental levels that, are, that have children or that have grandparents in the house and different ages, that we all have different developmental tasks. It's very different being with a teenager and you know, a grandparent in the same house, in the same space, trying to manage through this together. We need to think about the differences dealing with this, whether we're a parent or a grandparent, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this unless people have questions, but, but realize that the roles of parents and grandparents are always different. And during this particular challenge and crisis, some of those differences have been particularly challenging and have created some additional stress. And if there's time, we'll talk about that more later. But I wanna get to my alphabet of muddling and managing. My, uh, I don't, you know, I'm of that age where I don't remember anything unless it has an acronym or a code. So my alphabet of muddling and management is three E's and an F. Uh, that one E and three F's. Oh my gosh, that's wrong on the top of the slide. It's one E and three F's. It's expectations, flexibility, fun, and fuel. And we're gonna deal with each of those separately to help us muddle and manage. What do I mean by managing expectations? I mean, first of all, accepting the developmental realities that I can't expect preschoolers to deal with the disappointment of things not, them not being able to have a play date in the same way that I ask an adolescent, in the same way that we as adults deal with the difficulty with our own limited play dates, with the amount of social isolation that we've all experienced. I have to, in terms of managing expectations, there's a wonderful Jewish saying or Jewish paradigm of dan l'chavschut, give people the benefit of the doubt. Somebody didn't call you all week, you can think, oh my gosh, she's not a good friend. He really doesn't care about me. I can't believe he's so disconnected, not reaching out to me. Or we can give them the benefit of the doubt and say, who knows what they're dealing with on their plate. Managing our expectations means rather than immediately judging, thinking maybe there's another explanation and realizing that it's better to be pleasantly surprised than disappointed. Psychologically, it is easier for us to deal with, you know what, I don't expect friends to call me in this time. Things are difficult. If our connections are more limited, if we don't talk as much, we can't physically get together in some cases, I understand friendships are going to be more difficult to maintain, that I'm pleasantly surprised when I do get that phone call. The current situation is so rife with uncertainty that in some ways we have to let go of expectations. Whether those expectations are, here's what a bat mitzvah looks like. Here's what Pesach looks like. Here's how we celebrate Hanukkah. Here's what my Friday nights look like or what my Saturday night out with my friends and family look. We have to let go of those expectations. But we may also have to realize that in the current uncertainty, we have to let go of the things we expect of ourselves. My mother, God bless her, is 87 years old, lives independently in Florida, sharp as a tack. And just about every single day that I speak to her, I've, not, I've also not seen her in a year, 
Um, but we, you know, FaceTime, Skype, all those things frequently. But almost every phone call she says to me, Rona, I can't believe I haven't cleaned out a closet. Here I am in the house every single day. Why don't I get to the closets? A sock drawer, something, my files. I should be doing something. And every single day I tell her, let it go. Stop expecting that in the midst of your life turned totally upside down, you're gonna clean out your sock drawer. It's okay not to meet those expectations. It's okay not to be making 12 course meals or eating on China or, or doing Shabbat the way that you normally do it. It's all right if the bed isn't made. It's all right if your thinking, feeling and doing are not at their typical um, levels. Although we'll, we'll talk in a moment about when we should be concerned about that. The next, the, the next piece about expecting is that if we're gonna manage our expectations, we also have to manage dealing with loss. Part of that loss is just disappointment that it isn't the bat mitzvah I thought I would be able to give my child or that I would dance at with my grandchild. And how do I see my glasses half full? How do I celebrate the wonderful moments that we've had and that we've been able to share, even though it wasn't at all what I expected? How do I manage the loss of traditions and rituals? My, my family, my, my husband's family has always had an extended family Hanukkah party. It's the one time all year that we all get together from across the tri-state area. And of course, that ritual is gone this year. There's no way. So we had to create a new ritual and it actually, we, we did a virtual party and we wound up doing a, a Hanukkah Mad Libs as a family, which became quite popular and has already, already there have been requests for, can we do this whether we're together or not um, next year? Managing loss also requires validation and reassurance. One of the things that particularly those of us who are parents and grandparents have an automatic reflex when our children or grandchildren come to us sad about a loss, about a disappointment, our immediate reflex is we wanna make it better. And we think we make it better by nullifying it, by saying, oh, it's no big deal. You missed sixth grade graduation, don't worry. It's even better in middle school. You'll have, you wait till you see what eighth grade graduation is. Now that's something you don't wanna miss. But when we fail to validate, then reassurance is not heard. Then the person we're trying to make feel better feels as if we didn't hear them. We didn't feel their pain. We didn't recognize it. Validation, by the way, is an agreement. It isn't saying to our sixth grader, I know life as you know it is over because graduation didn't happen the way you wanted. I know life will never be the same. That's it forever. You know, it, it's the worst thing that can ever possibly happen to you. That's agreement. Validation is not agreement. Validation is, I feel so bad for you. I know you were really looking forward to this. It's terrible. I really wish I could do something that could give you back something you really wanted. That's validation. And that's, then, then I can provide reassurance and say, maybe there are other ways we can deal with it. And then I can move to a forward focus. Then I can move to, what could we do instead? How could we celebrate this milestone? Is there some other way we could mark this, um, this event um, and, and deal with it? And of course, the most significant loss that all of us have had to manage through this. And you know, it's, I have to be more delicate if I'm talking to children, but here we are grownups, is I can't imagine that there's anybody here with us tonight who doesn't know someone who has experienced a first degree loss, who has had to have a funeral or be at a funeral, or I know, I know I'm exhausted from going to Shiva um, Zoom calls, that it just seems way too frequent. And we have to realize that we are living in a time with unprecedented losses. So what do we do? Remember that palm tree, flexibility promotes resilience. And so I'm moving from the E, from expectations to now all of the Fs. And the first one is flexibility. We have to accept that change is an essential part of life. Yes, COVID is causing more change than we'd like, but 
living in, in a static way doesn't work. At the same time, if we look around, there are certain things that do not change. I've, I've heard so many people say, and I, I think today's Holocaust Remembrance Day, I've heard so many people say, yes, we may have had a shutdown, but we had it in the comfort of our homes. We weren't, most of us, please God, going out hungry. We weren't worrying that, you know, God forbid we were going to be dragged out of our house by an evil and, and hostile uh, dictator. So there are some things that don't change about our safety and our security, about what we have with us in our lives. Um, flexibility also means being willing and open to the new. No, I can't go to the gym, but maybe it's a time to try that yoga video or think about doing some Zumba or try some other, you know, I hate exercise. I'm the worst person to, to talk about it, but try some new um, exercise or, or maybe I can't go to that class. I'm gonna try an online learning opportunity. It may seem like an oxymoron when you talk about flexibility to say plan, but one of the best ways to be flexible is to over plan, to plan 12 different ways. If I planned that my exercise is going to be walking and it becomes icy and cold and rainy and miserable, then that exercise doesn't happen. But if I say, well, I'm walking, unless I do Zumba, unless I do yoga, unless I get on the treadmill indoors, then it's more likely that I'm gonna be able to be flexible. So think about how you can plan flexibility into your life. The next F is about fun, finding it and making it. And the hard part about this is really the last statement here. It takes effort and energy to have fun and to make fun and to find fun. I will tell you, it is much easier to just lay in bed and catch but it doesn't do us any good. It doesn't make us feel better. It does make us feel better when we inject fun, which means we have to think about what is it you love? I'm a big word game player. And so figuring out how to play boggle with friends online, figuring out how to um, do shared video watching of funny movies, Fun often comes from things like novelty, something you don't usually do, role reversal or a mismatch. If, if you're a teacher, having your children teach you. If you're an adult, putting the children in the adult role and you be the, the child. Um, healthy competition is a great way to have things be fun and realize that the investment that you put in to creating the fun for you uh, is, is going to pay off dividends. Of course, some of us have things in our lives that we already know are fun for us. I have crafts that I do. And so maybe it means, again, that planning again, putting in the time, going on Amazon, ordering my supplies and planning in, when in my day am I gonna allow that creativity? When in my week am I going to do that? Making sure if you love baking like the picture here or cooking, that you've got the ingredients there to make your favorite um, items. The next F is similar because fun is one of the fuels, one of the things that builds us up, that uh, gives us the energy and the wherewithal to go forward. But it isn't fun isn't the only thing. We have to first recognize that we are our, our, we are uh, physical beings and that our basic biology matters. Our food, our nutrition, our sleep, and our exercise are the basic ingredients to have a good engine running in our body. And I think we tend to underemphasize these. A lot of people have talked about, you know, the the you know the COVID fifteen, not the COVID nineteen. The COVID-15, it's the 15 pounds everybody gained during the shutdown last spring. Um, my husband walks around the house sometimes saying that, you know, all you do if you're home is eat. It's terrible. If you work from home, there's just too much food available. It's not good. So we have to think about how do we set the stage for healthy choices for our biology? How do we create better sleep hygiene for ourselves? And if you have children at home, for our children, 
I know that the research that was done in the spring when the country was more or less on shutdown um, indicated that all of our sleep patterns were disturbed and that many people developed poor sleep habits and getting back into good sleep habits is important. And I can't um, overemphasize as much as I said, I hate it, uh, exercise. Exercise is the body's automatic antidepressant. Exercise releases chemicals in the brain. Even moderate exercise for 20 minutes will cause a release of endorphins, which are the body's natural mood lifters. And so think about how you increase your physical exercise. It doesn't have to be, you know, two hours of aerobics or weightlifting, but even 20 minutes of activity is, is helpful. There's been a lot of discussion this uh, late fall, winter, and now into the spring that we are beyond the surge. What does that mean? It turns out that in times of crisis or trauma or stress, most of us experience a surge of energy initially. That we do do those closets and we do make those plans and we say, we're gonna get through this and I'm gonna feel okay. And I have 18 different plans and I'm gonna journal and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna write and I'm gonna organize. And, and then we run out of gas. We literally run out of energy. Um, educators have talked about it with students that you know last spring, was hard for students. Initially, they came back to school in the fall energized and excited, but now it's hard. And it's hard to mount that energy and have them keep going. And so it becomes even more important to think about what fuels me. It turns out that there are two Gs that help fuel us. One is gratitude. The more we focus on blessings, the more energized we are. There's so many studies and, and there's, they're absurd in their simplicity that in two weeks, if for two weeks, you simply take a piece of paper and every day for two weeks, at the end of the day, you write down between one and three things that you're grateful for. Small things, it snowed yesterday, I didn't have to shovel, it all melted. I'm insanely grateful for that. Um, it looked really pretty, but I didn't have to shovel. Um, they don't have to be big things. I'm grateful that my, my dinner didn't burn. Small things that we're grateful for, but just the act of writing it down for two weeks increases happiness, decreases depression, and get this, it increases your immune system. You're more likely to have a better response to a flu shot if you have been practicing gratitude beforehand than if you didn't. So imagine as we're dealing with COVID, with a worldwide pandemic, what a boost it would be to our immune system if we could just focus more on being grateful. And the other thing that boosts us, that fuels us, believe it or not, is giving. We get an enormous amount when we give. Imagine this wonderful little psychological study. It's old, you can tell, because $50 meant a lot at the time this study was done, but they gave $50 to individuals and measured their happiness. And after they got $50, guess what? They were happier. There was a noticeable increase in their happiness and they tracked it for a few weeks. And then they gave another group of people $50, but with one caveat, they said, you can do anything you want with this $50, except use it yourself. You must use it to give to a charity, buy something for someone else, but you can't use it on yourself. Not only did the givers get the same boost in happiness, but seven weeks out, it was still there. They were still happier. The people who spent the 50 bucks on themselves weren't happy anymore. It is better for us to give than receive. And thinking in this time period about how we give, how we engage our families in being generous, in a way to keep us going um, is really, it's a wonderful opportunity. The final, uh, the, the final issue I wanna talk about is, is not an E or an F, it's the dreaded C. It's that in these difficult times, we may face some conflict. How do we deal with people who feel differently about the situation than us, perhaps even within our own family? We have to realize that we can only respect other people's position. They may, again, 
giving them the benefit of the doubt, there may be a reason. We have to understand that there's going to be personal difference, that some people are going to be more comfortable with certain activities than others. Some people are more stressed out than others. And we also have to realize that we may be dealing with our friends and family, not at their best, because stress does not always make us our best selves. It can bring out, think about yourself when you're irritable or when you're on edge, you may not be your best self. I wanna just say that speaking to Park East parents and shul members, I can't you know, end without adding that we really as Jews have a particular gift in our spiritual understanding of the world, that we have an ability to take stock, to think about our connection to God and to the divine, to realize that in our Jewish tradition, we believe so clearly that A, we are not alone, that we are not in this alone, and B, that human beings have an infinite ability for change and growth. It's why we have Yom Kippur every year, because every year we get to start again. It's why we begin every morning, Modet Ani, thank you, God, you gave me another day. It's my restart button. Maybe today I'll be better than I was yesterday. Maybe today the world will be better. Maybe COVID will be better. Um, these spiritual ideas, I think, are also enormously helpful in managing through. And last but not least, you know, when you fly on an airplane, and please God, soon in our days, we will all fly to places we love and people we want to visit, myself especially. I'm feeling the distance from family. You know that wherever you're flying, you hear the same announcement on the airplane. If the cabin should suddenly lose pressure, oxygen masks will drop from above. And what do they tell you? Even if you are flying with people who need assistance, please affix your mask first before helping others. Those of you who are parents, those of you who are caring for parents, those of you who are grandparents helping your children or your grandchildren realize you are no good to anyone if you don't take care of yourself. So think about how you manage your expectations, how you find fun, how you fuel yourself, how you find faith and meaning and spirituality and be flexible to manage through the transition. Realize we're living in a time like no other and that even though you can only change you, that's all any one of us can ever do, we have ripple impact. It's like when you throw a, a stone into a pond, the, the stone drops in one place, but the ripples go out across the pond. Every time we change ourselves, our families, our classrooms, our communities are changed also. So it's not a small thing to say that we change ourselves. Um, I've given you information about where you can get um, Oh, I didn't even. Uh, this is my this is my uh, my uh, my book on reassurance in difficult times. Which, if we have time, I'll tell you the story of how bizarre it is on April Fool's Day in the middle of a pandemic that a book you've been working on for years gets published. Um, but information on on the book and also on lesson plans that are available on helping children in uncertain times um, deal with anxiety and be reassured are available there. Let me stop sharing. And good, we are, I am good on time, right? And I am ready for questions <laughs> or comments or thoughts that people want to share. Dr. Novick, first of all, thank you. You've given us so much information and so many tools that we can use in our own lives. There are some questions and I'd like to share some of them with you. There are so many tensions going on now between families and friends, mostly because people observe differently. One person wants someone else to come to their house for a Shabbos meal. Another one gets annoyed that her best friend won't let her child come over for a play date. How do you handle it? What do you do when people have different levels of observance on how to handle COVID? So it's so interesting, Mrs. Etra, because you know you use the word observance and I'm thinking, you know, we Jews have been kind of doing this for a very long time, having nothing to do with COVID. What did you do when you kept kosher in a different way than other people kept kosher? 
you know, what do you do? We, we've struggled with this in our communities, particularly in our communities that are more open and diverse with how do I deal with having a friend who doesn't keep Shabbat the same way I do? And my answer is, first of all, you in, in this instance where we're dealing with not religious observance, but observance that really ties to people's feelings of safety and security, that you have to do what feels right for you. But that you have to find a way to tell others with total respect and understanding um, I had the wonderful experience of a, a very, very close friend marrying off a son who I have known since he was in her belly. And I very much wanted to be at this wedding. And this is the way I got invited. She called and she said, you're totally fine saying no. Here's what the wedding's going to be like. There's where the chuppah will be outdoors. I will tell you the other side is not going to be wearing masks. We will, but I know that the, you know, the other parents are not going to have masks on. I will totally understand if you don't feel comfortable coming, whatever you decide will be fine with us. That's an example of recognizing and saying, this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna respect what you do. Now, I think we can go even a step further. And if you can't have a play date, your child can't have a play date at someone's house because you're not comfortable with indoors or with what maybe you can say, but we're going ice skating in the park. Why don't we do that together on Sunday? Because you may feel more comfortable with an outdoor play date. I think we have to problem solve and try to be as open and honest as we can. And to some extent, own your own concerns. You know, say, it's, it's not about you. It's just, I'm too anxious about my mother or catching it or bringing it home to or getting it at my job or, you know, the rules in my office are such that if I do X, I can't go to work on Monday. So I'm sorry, I, I can't do um, the kind of play date. Thank you. That's a, that's a good way to think about it. A great question. If I'm so anxious and I'm so nervous, how can I make my child feel secure? Um, take acting lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say all the time, a parents don't need to be superheroes. Like it's absolutely fine to share with your children, you know, COVID has me worried too. This is very serious and it's scary. And mommy and daddy, we get scared too. Now where you have to go with that is, that's why we wash our hands, I think all the time, by the way, about Mr. Rogers, who had such <laughs> wisdom in so many things. He always said, look to the helpers. Well, in COVID, one of the things we can tell our children is not only, yes, we're nervous and we're anxious, but look at how all the doctors are working to keep us healthy and look how people are wearing masks. But we also can be the helpers ourselves. Every time you wash your hands, you're helping. Every time you wear your mask, you're a helper too. Think about all the things all of us are doing to try to make this better. Now I said parents don't have to be superheroes. It's okay to share that I'm anxious too. It is not okay to fall apart in front of your children. It's scary for children if adults can't handle things. That's why they make closed doors. You know, if you're gonna fall apart, go behind a closed door and have your good cry. But in front of our children, we have one job and one job 24-7, 365 days of the year, and that's to be the grown-up. You know, for many years, I worked in a, in a children's hospital, and I occasionally covered the pediatric emergency room. And I can't tell you how many times we had to remove parents from treatment rooms because their children were getting stitches or they were getting a cast, and the parents were making the children worse because they couldn't be the grown-up and they couldn't stay calm. And I have to tell you, if a child's getting stitches and the parent says, oh my gosh, that needle's too big. That's not good. <laughs> That's not gonna help anyone calm down. So if you're running around the house saying, this is never gonna end, this, this pandemic is just, look at how many dead and it's endless and we're never gonna see grandma again. That, that's not, you, that's adult worry and you have to protect your children from that. And along those lines, I realize I didn't say anything about media, but we really, we really have to think very carefully and do our own soul searching about what the impact of 
all of the media coverage is on us and on our families. And we have to have the self-discipline to turn it off, to say, you know, because we live in a world now where everything is a breaking story. Everything is, the, I, it makes me crazy now, you can't watch the news anymore without, in addition to what you see on the screen, there's a crawl going along and there's a starburst on the top and there's emergency right. flaring. It's all sensationalized as is everything is an urgent story. And in fact, I've realized the same news is on at four, at five, at six, at seven, at 10, at 11, and again tomorrow morning at eight. What does it do to my blood pressure if I watch it all those times? And talking about sleep hygiene, I, I, I routinely, I will not watch news after 10 o'clock at night because if I do, I'm not sleeping. I won't read a newspaper after 10. I've learned that about myself, but we also have to learn it about our children and think about how do we insulate and in some cases, you, you can't eliminate them seeing, you know, in New York City where you are, you see it on the side of a bus, you see the cabs have, have uh, you know, news stories on them. An opportunity for my children to ask me about it, to talk about it, again, where I'm the voice of calm. Um, so it's, a, you know, the bottom line, Mrs. Etra, is it's okay to share your anxiety, but you have to be the grown up and find private adult places where you can really unwind and let loose, but not in front of your children. Sounds good. Here's a good one for you. How can I ever reassure my child that things will ever be normal again? So now I have to get to this story. Um, <laughs> after 9-11, after believe it or not, that long ago, parents asked the same question. Not only were they asking the question, but in working with parents in New York, I noticed that parents stopped answering. You know, children would ask things like, are you coming home for dinner? Will you be home for dinner? And parents would like not know what to say because who knows what's gonna happen in the world. And at the same time, children need to hear, oh, you know, mommy comes home for dinner. I love having dinner with you. And even though in truth, whether it's 9-11 or COVID, who knows what tomorrow holds for any one of us that's beyond our pay grade, children need that reassurance and they need the language of reassurance. They need to know that the, the book that I wrote, which is really a, a metaphor or a, a parable, Mommy, Can You Stop the Rain?, my granddaughter, when she saw the book the first time, she said, um, Safdie, you know mommies can't stop rain, right? <laughs> like, you know that only God can do that? It's like, yes, sweetheart, I, I know that. But you can't stop the rain, but you can hold your child while the rain is making scary noises. And you can't shush the thunder, but you can play with pots banging them like a marching band. And you can't turn on the lights in a blackout but you can get a flashlight and make shadow puppets. And finding that language of reassurance, which basically says, I'm here now, I'm with you through this, and I'm gonna be with you through it, even if it's hard. That's what our children need to hear from us. Now, I think they also, we can reasonably tell them, there are a lot of really smart people working on this COVID puzzle. And it's amazing. It's nothing short of miraculous. I'm going for my second injection next week. I'm so excited, my second vaccine. Um, it, there's, it's nothing short of miraculous that a vaccine in such a short period of time has been developed and created and it's making so many people healthy. And there will come a time when we look back and we say, remember that COVID year? But that's what we have to tell our children. And we have to tell them there was a time when there were other terrible, terrible illnesses and really smart people figured out how to keep us safe and how to keep us healthy. And we're so lucky that we have a world with scientists who do that and with doctors and with policemen and with firemen and with teachers and with everybody who does all these wonderful things to keep us safe and keep us healthy and keep us growing. And the same way I said before for, for us, to point out to children the things that haven't changed. We may not go to Shabbat groups, but we still have Shabbat. 
and we can still play Uno together the way that we always did on Shabbat afternoons. You know, school may look slightly different. We may be wearing masks, but we still have circle time in preschool and read stories together. What are the things that are unchanged and unchangeable that can give them that sense of security? People are asking, is it normal to worry? I'm not exactly sure what normal means, but is it, the question is, is it normal to be yes. so worried? Yes. So, so uh, not only is it normal, my brother reminded me when COVID first hit and we were all in, in last spring, we were all kind of reeling with how fast this, how quickly this became so deadly. Um, the, he, he reminded me that after 9-11, I came back from a training with a leading trauma expert. And I told him that what he had said was that every single person in the room would qualify for having post-traumatic stress disorder just by virtue of living in New York and what we're experiencing, except for one thing, and that's you have to have symptoms for six months or more, and it was only two weeks after the towers. <laughs> so I, I think that we have to recognize that we are living in an abnormal situation and it would be kind of crazy not to worry. I, I worry about the people who go to mass parties and say, ah, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. I mean, I, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I don't mean to make a political statement here, but I, I worry about people who have so little worry that they may be acting in ways that endanger themselves and that make our situation um, worse. I think we always want, you know, we don't want children who run out into traffic. We want enough worry that they stay on the sidewalk and wait to hold our hand or learn to wait for the green light and the walk sign and look both ways. So some worry in this situation is normal. If you're worried about your worrying, think about frequency, duration, and impact. Frequency is your worry constant, is it or daily? You know, is, is it there all day long? That's duration. Also, is it there all day long? Does it just stay with you like a cloud and you can't get past it? And uh, impact. It's one thing to worry all day long, but go about your business and function and do your job, raise your children, cook your meals, you know, order your groceries or go shopping. It's another thing to be under the covers with them pulled over your head and not functioning. If, if it's at that level, then it's time to seek help. Then it's not normal. And it's, it, even if it were normal for the circumstance, it's not functional and you need help to get past it. And there are both, um, uh, there are ways to deal with severe anxiety that involve you know, things like meditation and mindfulness and relaxation. And there are ways to deal with severe anxiety that are in the medical uh, arena. But if you're really struggling, then it's time to think about getting help if, if it's interfering with your ability to function. Now, in, in small ways, you know, everybody's talking about COVID brain. Everybody talks about not being as efficient and as effective uh, as they were. And part of that is, you know, I'm working out of a box instead of out of an office that has 18 file cabinets and, you know, everything exactly where I, that I know where it is. And now I'm kind of trying to make it work in a different environment. Um, so part of it is that, part of it is anxiety that that's interfering with all of our mental capacities. But again, that I, that I think is normal and I wouldn't worry about that. One less thing to worry about. One less thing, all right. And if we're going to end, what, what is the last piece of advice that you'd like us to take away from your talk with us this evening? I, I think that there's, that, that all of us have a place in ourselves of positivity. All of us have that hopefulness, that belief in the future, that, um, that gratitude for the blessings that we have and finding that and being in touch with that on a regular basis, finding a moment every day where whether it's counting your blessings or whether um, my spouse walked in yesterday and, and said, I, why am I hearing music? I thought you're working. And I said, I realized that one of the things that fuels me is music. And I particularly love Brahms Piano Concerto number two. 
And I just had it play in the background all day yesterday when I worked. And I have to tell you that I got in touch with that part of myself that just feels that music is a gift. And it was unbelievable. Like what genius created this sound, this, this beautiful um, concerto, and then what genius played it. And it's there for me to listen to at will finding those moments and, and just giving those moments to yourself, I think they're so, so important. Dr. Novick, I hope I'm going to remember everything you've said so I can use it in my own life. I wanna thank you on behalf of all of us for your wisdom, your experience, your knowledge. And I'm glad that this is all going to be on YouTube so I can replay it again if I forget anything. Dr. Novick, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us at Rabbi Arthur Schneier Parkview State School and Parkview Synagogue. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Stay well.